but you've also managed the transition successfully, which is, so you've managed a lot of transitions in your life successfully, mm. right? That's, that's, it's hard to be successful at one thing. It's a lot harder to be successful at successive things. And a lot of the things you've done have been quite different. Mm. So, but what, what is one co co common theme? Yeah. I'm a journalist. And actually, what is a journalist? It's somebody who's curious, who's quite judgmental, um, who's interested in people. Mm -hmm. um, who's interested in talent normally, or people who are able to display a talent at something. I find most journalists are drawn to that. They want to get to the truth. They want to get to answers. Mm -hmm. When I look at whether I was a newspaper editor, uh, whether I was a talent show judge, whether I was even competing in Celebrity Apprentice with Donald Trump uh, in, on his show, whether I was doing a morning show, whether I was doing any of these things, or what I'm doing now, the common thread of all of it are those that skill set that I developed as a young journalist, I think has held me in brilliantly good stead for every single thing I've done. And you, you think that that's been transferable as well to like Britain and America's Got Talent? Because that, that seems like a, a fair well, departure well, from Well, Simon Cowell hired me for America's Got Talent, which was the first one yeah. of the whole franchise, um, because he said, you're just as arrogant, obnoxious, and as judgmental as uh, me. Ah, uh, I see, I <laughs> and see. And what he wanted was somebody who was going to be not afraid to give strong opinions, not afraid to be judgmental, but also had, as he put it, a journalist's eye for talent. You're somebody, he said, who would put pop stars on the front page or television stars or right, whatever right. it may be, or politicians who were on the rise. So part of your job every day was to look for the next big thing and to look for the next talented politician, singer, right. you know, entertainer, whatever. And he said, I want you to apply that same discipline to judging acts on the stage. And actually, he was completely right. It's exactly huh. the same thing. When I saw all these acts, I, I've never been a juggler or a fire eater or, you know, had any experience of, Everybody's of a piano juggler. playing pigs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, everyone's tried, but I've never had any real experience of being any good at any of the things that the people in front of me were doing. But what I was good at was identifying ones that I felt a, a mass audience would like, that they would think were good, so I was able to judge talent far better than I was able to do any of the things mm -hmm. that they were all doing for me. That comes down to the journalistic chops that I think were honed in me from a, a young age. Mm -hmm. Part of a journalist job when you're running a newspaper, when you're doing a big CNN nightly global show, doing a, a loud, noisy morning show, part of it is identifying what you should be talking about and what you think other people would be yeah, interested right, in talking right. about. Mm -hmm. So that, again, just comes down to having an instinct, mm -hmm. which I think a lot, of, a lot of journalists too. have. So I think mm -hmm. the running thing is is the journalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's that capacity to separate wheat from chaff. I mean, I've watched Britain's Got Talent and America's Got Talent a fair bit. I have a real soft spot for it. It always makes me tear up. And mm -hmm. Simon Cowell is a very interesting person because he's a very strange combination of extremely sentimental and extremely judgmental. Mm. And so you can really see, and I, I, it seems to me that his judgmental capability is actually nested inside his discernment in that he really does care that the people who are making an effort and who are genuinely talented rise to the top. Mm. And the price you pay for that, obviously, is that the people who aren't genuinely trying or talented don't get to rise to the top. And he's also, I would say, got more sentimental and less judgmental since becoming a father, which is interesting. Because I've known Simon for nearly 40 years. His testosterone decrease. Yeah, before he had any commitments, yeah, he yeah. was wham, bam, take everybody down if he didn't think they were any good. Now he's much more empathetic. And I'm sure it's becoming a father that's done that too. I've noticed it tangibly on on screen. And it reminds me of Sir Alex Ferguson, who was the greatest sporting coach in history, I would argue, who was the great Manchester yeah, United yeah, yeah. football coach. And he always said that he loved to pick kids like 18, 19 year olds, because they played with utter fearlessness. And he said, once they started getting married, having kids, yeah, sure. having responsibilities, their risk taking and fearlessness started to diminish. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the peak time for a lot of footballers, in his estimation, was 18, Soldiers too. 18, yeah, 18, mm -hmm. 19, 20, 21. It makes perfect sense, but interesting to have the, the greatest coach of all actually outline that this was a real thing that he saw time and again. Going online without ExpressVPN is like leaving your keys in the car when you run into the gas station. 
Most of the time, you're probably fine. But what if you come back to see someone driving off with your car? In today's digital age, your online privacy isn't just a luxury, it's a necessity. Every time you connect to an unencrypted network in a cafe, hotel, or airport, you're essentially broadcasting your personal information to anyone tech-savvy enough to intercept it. And trust me, it doesn't take a genius hacker to do this. With some cheap hardware, even a precocious 12-year-old could potentially access your passwords, bank logins, and credit card details. Now you might think, what's the big deal? Who'd want my data anyway? Well, on the dark web, your personal information could fetch up to $1,000. That's right, there's a whole underground economy built on stolen identities. This is where ExpressVPN comes in. It's like a fortress for your digital life, creating an encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet. Their encryption is so robust that it would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to crack it. But don't let its power fool you, ExpressVPN is incredibly user-friendly. With just one click, you're protected across all your devices. Phones, laptops, tablets, you name it. That's why I use ExpressVPN whenever I'm traveling or working from a coffee shop. It gives me peace of mind knowing that my research, communications, and personal data are shielded from prying eyes. Use Jordan's link at expressvpn.com slash jordanyt to get three extra months free. That's expressvpn.com slash jordanyt to learn more. It's, it's interesting to me, again, to watch, say, those talent shows and see that that capacity for discernment is also very tightly associated with it's something like the desire to mentor, right? And it, mm. there's something about that that's very masculine because the masculine element of developmental facilitation is something like mentoring. It's something like encouragement. And mm. you can really see that in Cowell. And well, everybody who works on those mm. talent shows is actually quite good at that. But he's, he, he all, he seems to be genuinely interested in facilitating the development of the career of the people who are in fact talented and trying mm. and goes out of his way to do that. And I think it's it's part of the appeal of the show, you know, to watch him exercise that careful judgment that's also on the side of the person who's striving upward. Yeah. It's a lot of I mean he used to say to, to me when I when I replaced or well, didn't replace him, he couldn't be on America's Got Talent because he was on American Idol. So even though he created America's Got Talent, he wasn't able to be a judge. And he said to me, look, here's, here's the deal. Remember, I, I was, I was in dreamland. I'd been fired from my job as a newspaper editor thinking that's the end of my media career. And literally a few months later, I'm on the Paramount movie lot in Los Angeles in my trailer next to David Hasselhoff's trailer and Regis Philbin's trailer. And I'm thinking I could get very used to this. And then Cal roared up in his Ferrari, or whatever he had at the time. And he came and had a cup of tea with me. Very, all very British in my trailer. And he said, here's the deal. You can be as, as judgmental as you want, and you can be as brash as you like, and you can be everything that I know you to be when you want to be that tabloid editor kind of mindset. But you have to be right 80% of the time or more. Uh -huh. Otherwise, the act doesn't play with the audience at home. If they're looking right, at right. you being mean, yeah. but you're wrong, and they don't agree with you, yeah. the act doesn't fly. And that was very good advice because it concentrates your mind to think, not just what are you thinking of something, but actually what are the audience at home likely to be thinking here? And that particularly comes down to the empathy that you would want to show certain acts. Mm -hmm. and a good example would be Susan Boyle, mm -hmm. who became the, probably the greatest mm -hmm. breakout yeah, that was really star of any talent show everywhere, anywhere. I mean, there was a 47-year-old spinster from a Scottish village who never performed outside of her little community, who suddenly became the biggest superstar in music in the world, sold 27 million albums. And when the finale of the show took place live, there were news crews from NBC, ABC, CBS. It was, it was mm -hmm. insane. It was amazing. Insane. Mm -hmm. And we all, having initially been very judgmental in a way, if you look yeah, at the original yeah, clip, right. rolling our eyes. Yeah, who's oh, this? Who's yeah, this? Yeah. This is going to be terrible. Yeah. The evolution very quickly of, wow, we've got something special here. And then our desire collectively to then be very protective mm -hmm. to Susan because she'd had a tough upbringing. She'd been starved of oxygen when she was born and that made her a little socially awkward with a lot of people. And we were determined that she would get protected. And Simon was particularly determined. It was his show. This was one of his breakout stars. And that's all part of it. And I think that that is a side of him that people don't often see, but I saw it. His, his desire to protect 
Susan and people like her who were just so, so unused to the limelight. Mm. But she was extraordinary. I remember going to the Rockefeller Center in New York. It was snowing, literally like two feet of snow. And they had an outdoor stage and she was going to sing uh, I Dreamed a Dream from Les Miserables, the one that she sang on the show, live at 8 a.m. And she was vomiting in a dressing room 10 minutes before from fear. Mm -hmm. Utterly terror-struck. And at eight o'clock sharp, she was on that stage, now age 48, mm -hmm. uh, in the center of New York on God. NBC's Today Show. And she absolutely sang it completely faultlessly in front of a big mm. crowd outside. Amazing. And I remember looking at that going, that's extraordinary. That's for sure. So she had You something, never know what's inside people. And she man. had something magical. And the beauty of those talent shows is, you know, I always believe everyone's got something. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a talent. I genuinely believe that. And, you know, I remember going to the Soweto Township, for example, in South Africa once, and the kids singing and dancing and seeing some of them are thinking, I mean, you would literally win America's Got Talent if you sang like that on a stage. Mm -hmm. And these are penniless mm -hmm. kids in a, mm -hmm. in a township in Soweto. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody has a talent. You just have to find a way to unlock it.